I'm very, very pleased to introduce Domani Partridge of the um, Anthropology Department and the Department um, of Afro-American and African Studies here at the University of Michigan. Um, uh, Domani received his PhD in 2003 from the University of California at Berkeley, also in anthropology. The title of his thesis was Becoming Non-Citizens, Technologies of Exclusion and Exclusionary Incorporation after the Berlin Wall. I like that play of, of uh, uh, contradictions there, exclusionary incorporation after the Berlin Wall. Um, and I note that his committee included people that I talked to when I was at Berkeley, Judith Butler, Paul Rabinow, Alan Pratt in geography. Um, he's been teaching uh, at, at uh, Michigan since 2005, where he has been assistant professor and now associate professor. He's the author of a book which appeared last year um, uh, entitled Hypersexuality and Headscarves, Race, Sex, and Citizenship in the New Germany. That was published by Indiana University Press. He is uh, freshly back in Ann Arbor after a year in Germany on leave, and we are making him pay for that experience by <laughs> speaking for us today. So please join me in welcoming Domani Partridge. Thank you for, that, for the invitation and for the introduction, and I'm happy to pay, pay back <laughs> my time in Berlin. Um, I'm going to start actually with something that's actually fresh from Berlin, um, sent via uh, you know email um, and downloaded over the internet, um, which is a film that relates to the paper that I'm going to give um, that directly thinks about the relationship between uh, youth youth movements and and um, what I what I call democratization as exclusion, which I'll explain as I uh, give the talk. But I'm going to start with the film and then I'll I'll move to the talk itself. It's just a short three and a half minute. Uh, film. Can we? Is there is there a way to yeah. to dim the lights? Okay. <laughs> Wollen Sie mich verarschen? Hier gibt es keinen Rassismus mehr? Wieso heißt das so? Also, wir sind halt Schwarzkopf alle. Und deswegen irgendwie Schwarzkopf, damit können wir uns identifizieren. Und BRD, Schwarzkopf, BRD, einfach Deutschland. Und wer ist hier das Opfer? Weil äh, oft gesagt wird, dass wir die Opferrolle irgendwie immer annehmen. Und wir wollen zeigen, dass wir keine Opfer sind, sondern wir auch was machen können. Also Widerstand leisten und dass wir kämpfen dagegen. So. Ich hab's satt! Es ist auch immer ein Problem, zum Beispiel, dass, äh, wenn man über Rassismus spricht, dass man immer nur rassistische Muster reproduziert. Und im Theater versuchen wir das eben auf andere Art und Weise darzustellen, dass wir nicht ständig das reproduzieren, wogegen wir eigentlich angehen wollen. Wir wollen damit zeigen, dass es einfach keinen Rassismus mehr geben soll, dass jeder ein Mensch ist und jeder ist auf seine Art und Weise etwas Besonderes. Für mich persönlich ist Theater nicht das Einzige, mit dem ich es mache. Ich finde, durch Musik, durch äh, Poesie, durch Rappen geht das auch richtig gut. Und, aber ich finde, und auch mit Kunst, mit allem, aber ich finde, Theater ist der Ort, wo alles zusammenkommt. Ob Schwarzkopf oder schwarzer Mensch, das sind beides Sachen, die so irgendwie in der Gesellschaft, in der wir heutzutage leben, einfach irgendwie was Negatives in einem auslöst und ihm anscheinend Angst macht. Und da ist doch eigentlich die größte Frage, wieso? Wieso macht es den Menschen Angst, dass es jemand anders ist als sie? Und wohin kann das führen, dass dieser Mensch anders ist? <lacht> Wieso haben wir 68 Leute gemacht? 
Das ist ein ganz wichtiges Datum in der Geschichte ist und alle damit so ein bestimmtes Gefühl verbinden und das wollten wir halt ins Stück reinbringen. Genau, und wir wollen auch eine, vielleicht eine eigene Partei so gründen im Stück oder auch vielleicht so allgemein, Schwarzkopfpartei oder sowas. Und die Black Panthers waren einfach so, die waren das Erbe von Malcolm X. Sie haben von Malcolm X das angenommen, was er sagte und haben versucht, das in die Tat umzusetzen. Und sie haben sich nicht mehr alles gefallen lassen. Egal welche Hautfarbe, egal ob Mann oder Frau, sie haben gekämpft. Wir wollen zeigen, dass es Menschen gibt, die das immer noch machen. Wir machen heute Geschichte. Wisst ihr noch? 68. Um, so I'll contextualize this through the, the paper. So I won't talk about it directly at first. Although um, you were seeing the pre-premiere because it's actually premiering in Berlin next week. Part of the power dynamic I'm examining here is the relationship between participation and democratization. Participation is a term that social workers and youth workers in Berlin use, particularly those trained in East Germany, to indicate group decision making from the bottom up and including the voices of activist youth. Democratization, on the other hand, is a term that the post-World War II allies and now the central government planners use. It emerges from the top-down post-World War II occupying allied effort to denazify Germany. Many argue that this strategy was necessary in the post-World War II moment when Nazi ideology still predominated in state and local governments, as well as in the hearts and minds of former Hitler youth, the middle-aged and the elderly. Full participation then, without, consent for Nazi, without consequences for Nazi ideology, might have put Nazi thinking back on center stage. Anthropologist and scholar of contemporary French citizenship, Paul Silverstein, has argued that it is precisely because one has the expectation that one should have access to universal rights that one rises up in France. Following the work of political philosopher and intellectual historian Susan Buck Morris, one might take the Haitian Revolution as a large-scale dynamic which proves his point. As Buck Morris argues, the Haitians successfully fought to erase the gap between French claims of universality versus their positions as those who would be expected from this rule, who would be accepted from this rule because they were black. Contemporary uprisings in France might be read as a continuation of the unfulfilled claims and potential of the Haitian Revolution. However, the political articulations of those deemed not yet trained in democracy in the contemporary German context, which emerges from the context of the Nazi-administered Holocaust and the subsequent American occupation whom democratization have come quite differently. Thus, my work examines what, the, what has happened since democratization relied on America and its allied occupation. What are the effects of the post-Cold War German nation-state taking over these rigid forms of democratization in which, for certain subjects, participation was necessarily excluded? It is significant here that the Cold War ended as a victory for West Germany and that the state's form of democratization, one that it has learned, had learned from the Americans and was free to implement on its own terms after the occupation ended, could self righteously overtake the East German and migrant forms of governance and social life. If a key tenet of post-war West German democracy was never again, in reference to the Nazi-administered Holocaust, then it was up to the West German in institutions now to teach East Germans and migrants how to remember. This form of democratization, again a top-down ideology, was particularly relevant in the sense that with the fall of the wall, not only freedom, but also violence erupted with East German neo-Nazis as the most visible perpetrators of this violence, against so-called foreigners. On the other hand, Muslim men were seen as violent articulators of patriarchy, anti-Semitism, and potential terror. Given that these images became the central mainstream images of East Germans and migrants alongside images of the secret police and the East German governmental apparatus, which the mainstream West German media and politicians also compared to Nazi fascism, it became difficult to make political claims as East Germans or as migrants without also somehow appearing not to be not yet worthy of participation because they were not yet democratic. It was then up to West Germans to teach East Germans and migrants democracy, which included, as Daphne Bardal has pointed out, promoting the post-wall consumption frenzy and also regulating East Germans and migrants as those who had failed to account for their Nazi past or genocidal Turkish past vis-a-vis vis vis the Armenians or anti-Semitic Muslim present past, respectively. But since East Germans were also acknowledged as Germans, there was the possibility of ultimate rehabilitation, redemption, and mainstream incorporation. 
For this to happen, however, East Germans had to speak in terms of the new post-wall order, that is, consumption, economic efficiency, and privatization. The West German governing regime, however, did not hold out this possibility in the same way for non-citizens, that is, those perceived not to be German either because of their legal status, the way they moved, or their phenotypic features. Many activists and others have spoken to me about the turn away from multiculturalism just, as, just when the wall was falling. At most, and I would argue that the post-Cold War governance established this as a norm, one would have access to what I have termed exclusionary incorporation, where the emphasis moved from multiculturalism, and I, I think multiculturalism is also a problematic term, to integration. Integration, at least for those perceived as foreigners in many ways, was tied to the West German-led idea of democratization. This, I would argue, has been a massive site for social investment, for youth work, to s and, and schools, which one is re required to attend, attend in Germany. Homeschooling, like in the US, is illegal, and private Muslim schools are rare. After the policy of family reunification was established in the early 1970s and intensified through the late 1980s for families of former guest, so-called guest workers, migrant youth became a major presence in German schools and on the media landscapes. The mainstream representations, in part, had emphasized the repression of Turkish women, including the restrictions of movement, the marrying off of young brides, honor killings, and the insistence that young women wear headscarves. After September 11th, 2001, as scholars such as Yasmin Yildiz have pointed out, what was originally seen as a Turkish problem became a Muslim problem in the mainstream imagination. Under the new analytic umbrella, under this new analytic umbrella, anti-Semitism anti was seen as a key dynamic. Integration as democratization was be meaning, would mean educating those against these perceived tendencies. I call this form of pedagogy exclusionary incorporation because it would never be possible, at least not until now, for these subjects to become white Germans and thus full citizens. Even if the legal notion of citizenship opened up, this is what Etienne Balabar might call cult uh, this what Etienne Balabar might call culturally racist notion of citizenship remained. Non-citizens would be incorporated into the nation to the extent that they could be tolerated, or, as I've argued in my book, hypersexually in headscarves, live up to exoticized and often hypersexualized national fantasies. In terms of youth work and youth funding, and youth is a category category about which I'm skeptical, but it's nevertheless one that's constantly reinforced both from the period of, of uh, American occupation till now. Um, in terms of youth work and youth funding, with strong direction from the federal government, what linked neo-Nazis and Muslim subjects with a particular emphasis on immigrant male youth was the need for training in democracy. What separated them was the, was the potential to become normalized citizens. This, in part, this is in part demonstrated by the fact that young neo-Nazis have their own political party in parliament the NPD, which is able to foil attempts at being banned by avoiding explicit Nazi references. Jim Özdemir, the Turkish-German co-head of the Green Party, on the other hand, does not make political claims as a racialized subject. In a conversation with him and a historian colleague here at Michigan, uh, when I asked him why not, she pointed out that this, was, this would be too risky for him politically. He would no longer be able to remain in office. Well, I would like to make an argument for why participation should also be taken seriously as a possibility that would include those who would define themselves as neo-Nazis, disrupting the top-down administration of democratizing programs. I will today on the I will argue today on the, I will talk today about democratization versus participation of the so-called migrant youth. I will further examine the political forms that emerge out of that dynamic. Before moving to that part, and that I kind of gave you a preview with the with the film. Before moving to that part of the paper. I would like to say, though, that the social, economic, and political conditions that draw young people to neo-Nazism should also be taken seriously. These youth should also be taken seriously as those capable of democratic participation. One needs to take seriously the critique of the post-wall, post-1989 condition that has marginalized many of those who have remained in East German small towns and deindustrialized cities. This does not, however, mean that one should do this without working vigorously to prevent, challenge, and even push, punish this anti-Semitism or racism more broadly. I would argue that s the state is not doing enough to do this. Furthermore, one would be wrong if one assumed that these were distinctly East German acts. The projection of racism onto East Germans attempts to absolve normative West Germans of their culpability. In addition, one has to take seriously the extent to which the refusal of participation has led to the formation of organizations by young neo-Nazis, including the NPD and so-called migrants, who are engaged in strategies that seek to find space and care for those who might not otherwise have any viable space in the post-Cold War globalized and neoliberalized nation state. 
The difference here, however, is one of scale and funding. The NPD is a national party, which we're, whereas migrant networks, and particularly migrant youth networks, are much smaller, often local, and usually not in engaged in electoral politics. And, and increasingly, this funding, while youth centers were kind of a main, it's, you know, after the cold, after the um, occupation, youth youth centers were heavily state funded, but they're, they're becoming increasingly German say privatized. But in fact, this means that they're 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 subcontracted out to to small NGOs who who have to apply for for small pots of state funding. The difference. Um, the MP, the, and so the, the difference between the MPD and, and these kind of youth networks are, is, is one of scale and funding. The MPD is a national party, whereas migrant networks are particularly, and particularly migrant youth networks are much smaller, often local, and usually only engaged in electoral politics. The N MPD, on the other hand, is a party that exceeds, exceeded the 5% threshold to enter parliament, which means that it received government funds to support it as part of the process of pre preventing this kind of campaign financing lobbying efforts that take place in the U.S. Migrant youth, on the other hand, also receive state funding, but with the dynamics of exclusionary incorporation at work, most of that most of that funding is directed towards the politics of democratization, whereas only a small amount has become available for post-migrant, that is, critical spaces, such as the theater group that refers to themselves as real democracy. And that was this that was an example of, of that group that I showed you here, a youth a youth theater in at least symbolically post-migrant district. I was shocked recently as a Turkish, Turkish, German, and Arab Arab youth performed the characters of the 68 Olympics. And this is a, a, a kind of a performance previous to the one that I showed here. Standing on an improvisational award platform with the raised and clenched fists of black power. It wasn't only the image that shocked me, but the articulation of what it means, meant for them as to be black over and above the possibility of belonging to or representing the German nation. They first began by enacting the American scene, then they switched to the German context. They were doing improv, but it already seemed as if they had been embodying their lines for most of their lives. While they had invited me to participate as an advisor on Malcolm X and Black Power, I warned them that I was not an expert. They themselves had been reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and learning about American slavery from the perspective of Alex Haley's roots. In that performance, I felt a bit speechless. The stage lights were on, and they spoke as if, they were, as, as if it were their op opening night. In the debriefing after the performance, a white German woman who had come for the first time talked about her fear of the characters, which led to a heated debate, to which the advisor of the project responded in words credit he credited to Malcolm X, but which also which come out of the the um, British Asian context. Self defense is no offense is no offense. The young woman was speaking not only of the fear that the performance evoked for her, but also the fear in terms of the symbolic neighborhood within Kreuzberg called Kati, where mostly immigrants live and through which women in headscarves frequently move also where heroin addicts have traditionally hung out. We love Kadi, the, the advisor responded, indicating that for what the norm of German public feared was for him and the group as a, a safe space for their everyday being and possibilities for speech. One of the young men in the group who had been playing Malcolm X in the improvised performance started talking about a recent occurrence in which, he had st in which he was standing in line in a grocery store, not paying too much attention to his surroundings. And then an older woman started saying loudly to someone else th that he was following her. He surmised that this had more to do with his skin color than with his intention. He hadn't even noticed her, he said. He then went on to talk about the fact that his, relative, his relatives were getting kicked out of their apartments in Kreuzberg, with rents now approaching 2,000 euros per month. The, the neighborhood was now full of young students, he said. The young woman was saying that she could be persuaded to change her position, but she couldn't agree with the use of violence. The advisor suggested this was only one si stage in the development of Malcolm X, and that the solutions would, ha would, have, would have to come from the youth themselves. A young woman in the group who wears a turban, the one who actually invited me to participate in the group, noted that she often takes an aggressive posture on the street in order to preempt being offended. She said that it was also the job of the theater to provoke. A young man who had been playing the silver medal winner in the performance and who gladly gave up his medal for the sake of black power spoke about, the wom about women and with headscarves in Germany being accused of wearing bombs on their heads. At another meeting of the theater group that was coming together under the rubric of whose democracy, some of the youth recounted how because of their, their theater project that had taken place in a major nationally known and federally funded cultural center, their theater group, which had links to the youth theater and was led by the same advisor, was now being banned from this regular school day. Some of the teachers had accused their group of being fascist, just like the Nazis. The teachers were scared of the young youth's use of an oversized foam gun in their play. <clears throat> School classes had come to see the performance at the event that attracted over 4,000 visitors this past fall, fall or fall 2000, 
12. The play had to do with teachers from the perspective of the students purposefully mispronouncing their names, non-ethnically German names. In our discussion, one person recounted one of the teachers saying, quote, should we now worry that we will get shot if we mispronounce a student's name, close quote. Needless to say, in examining the contemporary implications of the relationships between occupation and blackness, and working through the circulations and transform transformations American blackness undergoes, as it moves from the U.S. and occupies other space, places, and other people, not, that is, non-citizens who may or may not be usually considered black. This work does not simply involve an analysis of Im images or representations. It also means analyzing the dimensions of occupation as they relate to performance, embodiment, and ultimately also to social mobility. So part of what I'm interested in here is the relate the both the, the claims of occupation and democratization, and then how those get taken up by the youth themselves, and how they get kind of transformed. So the how occupation itself is transformed through this unanticipated un, uh, occupation of and by American blackness. My contention is that the occupying presence of American blackness takes in a social, psychic, and physical dimensions best observed and analyzed through a rigorous analysis of popular print and oral media, and also through participant observation amongst youth in everyday settings, such as youth clubs, centers, and networks. In short, reading the contemporary reception of MTV and Hollywood in Germany are not enough to sustain this analysis, and occupation is not only significant as a result of its military history, it is necessary to understand the everyday stakes, rep 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 receptions, and performances of blackness in a range of settings, including those I have already begun to outline. Theoretical dimensions, diasporic aesthetics, and unanticipated subjects. Thinking through the German example of, and, and, and part of what I'm doing here is thinking about sort of what participant might be or what, what could constitute participation, given that democratization does not open up this kind of space that um, it claims to be opening up for migrant youth. Thinking through the German example and through the example of uh, African-American occupation, I've been working through some of the unanticipated implications of what Stuart Hall refers to as a promise of a diasporic aesthetic. African-American cultural forms not only gained an unanticipated profundity via the actual presence of African-American soldiers and their children in post-World War II Germany, but their actual presence created possibilities for new access, new identifications, and new enunciations, that is, places and positions from which to speak for non-citizens, including African immigrants, Palestinian subjects, Turkish subjects, and African, Palestinian, and Turkish Germans, among others. In Hall's formulation, diasporic aesthetics are configured via artistic practices such as filmmaking and photography that allow African diasporic subjects to reassemble a past in order to imagine a different future. Quote, we have been trying to theorize identity as constituted not outside but within representation, and hence of cinema, not as a second or order mirror held up to reflect what already exists, but as that form of representation which is able to constitute us as new kinds of subjects and thereby enable us to discover places from which to speak. He goes on to note that the point of these aesthetics is not to create an authentic singular past, but to construct the, those points of identification, those, posi those positionalities we call in retrospect our cultural identities, close quote. In this formulation, Hall's notions of diasporic aesthetics offer new possibilities for transnational affiliation and support for subjects who might otherwise have no social anchor to keep them from being in permanent drift amidst a nation state centered imagination of contemporary life, in which they live in a place where the mainstream society does not see them as natural, as a natural part of the nation state. Hall's formulation, however, did not, does not account for the possibility that unanticipated subjects find power in an aesthetics that never had them in mind, that authentic, authenticity, pleasure, and social transformation might be achieved through aesthetic borrowings, new embodiments, new circulations, and reformulations based on a shared experience that is shaped more by what is happening now than what by any search for lost origins. Arjun Patterai's notion of ethnoscapes also does not account for these potential audiences, that is, racialized subjects who identify with and structure their lives in relation to an Americanized blackness, even if they themselves are not of the African diaspora. Patterai's notion of media, techno, and finance scapes, though, open up the possibility for analyzing these situations differently. Other modes of occupation, Turkish Germans embody black Americans. Another case of occupying blackness. A New York Times article entitled A Bold New View of Turkish German Youth reported on April 12, 2003, quote, the film Altag, Everyday Life, has been criticized by some in the German press as too American in its sensibility and direction. But Kreuzberg's youth, in Mr. Celik's recounting, was strongly influenced by Hollywood and by the, Ameri the presence of Americans in Germany. It was also shaped by the black urban subculture transposed into the children of Turkish immigrants in Germany, a force adopted by Mr. Chalek into his movie. Quote, everything had to do with the Americans, he said, explaining the Kreuzberg world that he believes shaped him in his generation, the second of Turkish Germans. Quote, there was also the Turkish culture and our group mentality, but mostly it was the American movies. 
in the 1980s, everyone saw Scarface and everywhere, every, everybody called himself Tony Montana, Chalik said. He was talking about the ruthless drug trafficker played by Al Pacino, and this is still the New York Times. Hip hop was introduced in the neighborhood by the children of American servicemen stationed on Berlin's outskirts. They showed up as rappers at hip hop parties, Mr. Chalik said of the Americans, and hip hop and gangs belonged together. Mr. Chalik's own gang was called the 36ers, named after the last two digits of Kreuzberg's postal code. There were, battle, there were battles with the Black Panthers, a rival Turkish gang from Vedding, another heavily immigrant district in Berlin. Quote, we all took drugs and went to parties, Mr. Chalik said, but we weren't criminals, and the police kept a pretty close eye on us. We were all Turks because there were so many of us. Then in another adaptation of urban American culture, Mr. Chalik became what he called a graffiti sprayer. In a prior conversation with Chalik in 2002 at a film conference of the British Council that featured Turkish, German, and British Asian filmmakers, I asked him how he managed to become a filmmaker and get funding without getting any formal film training or attending one of the prestigious German film schools. He remarked, have you seen Training Day? And are you, are you all aware of the film, the Training Day, the, with um, uh, Denzel Washington playing a, 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 a kind of corrupt cop in, in Los Angeles? So he said, H have you seen Training Day? Yes, I said. You know, he's, you know, he said, you have to be like a wolf. He said, you have to be like a wolf. Denzel Washington said, you have to be like a wolf. I was a wolf. Chalik's reference to F extra human embodiment is simultaneously reference to Denzel Washington's hy hyperbolic performance of American blackness. Chalik does not refer to the actor directly, but to the performance of black masculinity and the necessity of this performance to make it in Germany. In the New York Times text and in the use of Training Day, it becomes clear that Chalik is participating in his own authentic authentication as, modern, as a modern subject in which he demonstrates modernness by demonstrating his blackness. In this sense, one must read Training Day as a training film not only for Ethan Hawke's character, the white American rookie who Denzel Washington's character trains to police the urban LA streets, <coughs> but also for Nigel Chalik. Beyond the film, Chalik's training and authentication comes through an identification with oppositional youth culture in the United States as transported through the bodies of occupying black youth in Germany, the children of American GIs and the American base in pre-unification, pre-1989 West Berlin. It is worth noting that he refers to the actual presence of these youth and not only to the popular process of Americanization as they are experienced in German movie theaters or on German TV. Chalik came of age in the youth center of the Naunienritze. As he notes, quote, I am myself a graffiti artist from the 80s. This is the same place where he later became a youth worker. He recalls the youth center as was a project started by the Allies to teach Americans democracy. And then Chalik points out the guest worker children came and they had other problems. The occupying presence, however, also had an impact on these unanticipated subjects. As Chalik's artistic in, in initiation as graffiti spares suggests, the occupying presence provides real possibilities for transnational affiliation of an aesthetic politics that counteracts forces and feelings of displacement. He moves from the youth participant to youth worker to film and theater and then opera director. On the other hand, inasmuch as the Turkish German never quite achieves the status of becoming black American, he also has to insist even more on the authentic authenticity of his performance as black to gain broader social recognition, to be on center stage. And, and since then, Chalik has gone on to win the, the, the Faust Prize for an opera, Gegen die Wand, Gegen, which took place in Stuttgart. In the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, a national newspaper art art entitled Der Spikli von Kreuzberg, the Spikli of Kreuzberg, the tone at some point seems mocking, perhaps reflecting a broader public skepticism about the place of Turkish Germans, even the refusal to recognize that such a hyphenated subjectivity could or does exist. Clear, however, even in the title of the article is the center, central place African Americans as a model for the po of African Americans as a possibility for inclusion and recognition. Chalik's authenticity as black is at stake in understanding him as modern. African Americanness becomes the grounds through which recognizability by the broader German public can be obtained. These grounds are critical both for Chalik and for the journalists, which might explain the journalists' intense insistence on referring to Chalik's Turkishness and refusing to authenticate his Americanized blackness, as can be seen in the journalist's representation of Chalik's difficulty in becoming Spike Lee. The, cr the critical tone which reflects the broader relationship to Turkish Germans is found in the extended title of the article itself, quote, the Spike Lee of Kreuzberg, earlier, na earlier NATO Chalik was in a gang, today he makes films, tomorrow he wants to be world famous. The journalist writes, it was a long damn way from Kreuzberg, it's a long damn way from Kreuzberg to Hollywood, one wants to say to him. It could be that one lifetime is not enough for this long trek. But if Chalik had told one 10 years ago that he wanted to take, make films, real film, feature films with real actors, clothes off streets, and a crane that carries a camera into the sky above Kreuzberg, 
then the reply would have assuredly been the following, grow up, Nejo, get your hobby tour, <coughs> your pre-university degree, or learn something practical. But filming is a dream on the order of becoming a jet pilot or the captain of a tanker. You don't have a clue, Nejo. You don't have, a, you don't have connections. You don't have a chance. This is the way, or nearly the way, that, 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 and this is still the journalist, that Nejo Chalik's father speaks today. As the son was filming, the father was invited onto the set. Look here, Kreuzberg is blocked off for three weeks. Look at the big lights and the actors and the whole film crew. Of all these people, I'm the boss. The father was not impressed. Nejo Chalik explains his father had acquired more practical his his brothers had acquired more practical practical skills. One is a mechanic, the other a police officer. That this impresses the father who came in the 70s from Anatolia. Um, that was from the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Here, the journalists contrast the film industry, read Americanized life, values, and dreams with the values, dreams, and hopes of rural Anatolia. He contrasts Nejo Chalik with his father, creating fake quotes to suggest that traditional, the traditional practica practicality impedes modern Americanized life. In the end, it seems that establishing gang affiliations and connections to American soldiers was part of establishing authenticity in place. Spike Lee was a mark of intelligibility for a mainstream German media. For the Frankfurt Allgemeine newspaper, though, it was not yet clear where or whether or not Chalek had succeeded, whereas for the New York Times, he had already demonstrated the never-ending presence and supposed superiority of Americanized desire and American becoming. In a later conversation with Chalek, whose film Alltag, Everyday Life, sub subsequently aired on ARD, the most-watched German television station, he pointed out that it was only after an interview with him and a review of his film appeared in the New York Times article that a number of German journalists began to change their opinion about him and the film. Quote, since when did the New York Times become the masthab, the standard for the German press, he questioned. Yet, through the process of becoming publicly recognizable, through the release of his fierce feature film, on the path toward establishing his authentic authenticity by connecting his work and his life to the American ghetto, th to American blackness, Nejo Chalik has, according to his own observations, begun to be recognized as a German filmmaker. Inasmuch as Turkish Germans, among others, can become Germany's blacks, and as much as they can be consumed, they relink Germany to an Americanized process, including social mobility that is tied to the language image of an American dream, which simultaneously includes consumption, modernity, and globalization. In many ways, the persistence of this reality remains part of the national subconscious. What is significant about Chalik's and related cases, including of African, Palestinian, Afro-German, is that incorporation happens through the occupying power of black Americanists in particular. If one watches German TV, goes to the German movie theater, or listens to so much of German popular radio, one experiences this undeni undeniable persistence of what Timothy Brown has called African Americanization in German everyday life. More broadly, quote, in recent years, American films have, have counted for 75 to 85% of German, the German market, whereas German films make up about 10% of the domestic exhibition market. Furthermore, quote, since the introduction of cable television in the 1980s, more and more American programs have been imported to fill the greatly expanded time slots. Within this context, the presence of black bodies is critical not only to the process of American Americanization, but also to the possibilities for social mobility in Germany. Occupying black power. Informally called the Turkish Malcolm X by critics, Fardun Zayumolu introduces his book Kanaksprach, 24 Misstone von Rande der Gesellschaft, Kanak Talk, 24 Dissonant Tones from the Edge of Society, with the figure of an American, American black power to intervene in the German literary imaginary. In fact, this move is what, he, what helps him, Fardun Zayumolu, to become a German celebrity. Chalik calls his, him his favorite author in Germany. Zayumolu writes, quote, Analog analogous to the black consciousness movement in the USA, the, in, in, the individual Kanak sub-identities will increasingly become aware of overlapping relationships and contents. The demystification has been introduced, the way to a new realism has been set. In the middle of mainstream culture, the, the, raw, the first raw proposal for an ethnic structure in Germany has come into being, close quote. And that's from 2000. Here, an African-American social movement, a movement that followed the Second World War, provides a model for Kanak articulation in Germany. Kanak, a racist term usually used against Turkish Germans and others in Germany, stands for a particularly German form of positioning that immediately points to the con contradictions of national citizenship, in this case for Turkish and other racialized Germans, through the related contradictions of African-American experience. Again, it is through this, the occupation of and by black bodies, that a form of enunciation can take place. Linking Zayumalu's published work to his public interviews, literary theorist 
Venkatmani notes, quote, the journalistic portrayal of Zayumulu as a young author established him on, this, on the one hand as an assimilated other who can uh, communicate and can be comprehended in the language of the majority, indeed in the vocabularies of assimilation, and on the other hand as the other who protects and sustains his otherness through a persistent defiance of assimilation. As is the case of Chelik, Zayumulu achieves popular recognition and is viewed as authentic not as a result of the perception of some authentic Turk Turkishness, but by the language of the African-Americanized street. As Mani notes, quote, he defines his public work as a process of empowerment of minorities and the reclaiming of cultural hegemony, close quote. I read the reclaiming of cultural hegemony directly in relation to a process of what I would call a counter-hegemonic occupation, which then also exceeds the initial relationships established in the post-war moment. In this sense, occupation directly engages the politics of cultural citizenship. It reformulates how one can be in Germany. It means that one, one need not only think of affecting social change as it relates to the context of the federal government or formal politics, it offers different political possibilities. Graffiti also, as articulated, for example, in Chalek's films and his other artistic works, operates as a way to occupy space, as does the re reconfiguration of German language offered in Zayumalu's books, Chalek's films in schools, youth, youth centers, and on the street. Of course, the differentiation, the difference between the other aesthetic renderings and the street formulations in the, that, in, is that the mainstream no longer sees the theater, film, and published versions as negative. In these articulations, it's, it is critical to understand occupation in the double sense I have been uh, suggesting thus far, that is both as a physical and as an imaginary psychic form. Graffiti occupies a physical space and, it's simultaneously as an and it works simultaneously as an aesthetic that occupies the imaginations and desires of Berlin and other cities. There are government poli policies to remove it, and yet there are also special paid tours to go see it. Recently, Berlin has become one of the most popular cities in Europe, and Kreuzberg, its famous so-called immigrant district, is, not, is no exception to this trend. Furthermore, on the west side of Berlin, uh, of the Berlin Wall during the Cold War, graffiti was seen as the articulation of freedom, while the East German side was, of course, unmarked. Right, so that, that, um, as I witnessed in 1989, as the wall was falling and street hawkers began removing and selling pieces, the most valuable pieces were those that had been spray painted. In fact, in Berlin in 1989, after renting a chisel to get my own piece of the wall, I noticed that, that, to, <coughs> that to make them appear more valuable, men were, going, were, were selling the interior pieces, would first spray paint them before removing them, as if, the, as, if, as if the suggestion that graffiti would ensure its authenticity. After the wall fell, an artist project known as Eastside Gallery uh, was commissioned to have a, a large portion of the formerly unmarked east, east side painted in, by international artists. Twenty years later, the street artists were invited back again to renew their work. Now graffiti and gentrifying housing blocks may be responsible for keeping rents low, as one spare put it, according to a recent tour guide of, of Berlin graffiti and street art, quote, because of, graffiti, because of the graffiti in this building, your rent is now lower, close quote. Unfortunately, these days, the graffiti may be having the opposite effect inasmuch as the counter-hegemonic occupation has been successful, neighborhoods are becoming cool precisely because of their street art. In part because of the international speculation, apartments in Kreuzberg sell for just as much as, as bourgeois neighborhoods in Berlin center. In fact, due to the placement of the wall and the neighborhood politics in West Berlin during the Cold War, Kreuzberg is also the post-wall center, is, is now in the post-wall center of, of Berlin. African occupying African American. In a conversation several years ago with, with, uh, in the United States with a theater director from the Congo short about my research on hypersexuality and black bodies in Germany, I learned that even in sub-Saharan Africa, young men planning to migrate to Europe were practi practicing their performance of black masculinity, learning to dance, speak, and move like African Americans. In my own observations, beginning in the late mid-1990s, in contemporary German clubs and asylum hostels, I saw African men wearing American baseball caps and FUBU jackets dancing to what Germans now call black music. In the mid-1990s, from asylum camps to dance clubs, I observed the performance as one of the only ways in which they could be intelligible as modern, not starving, humanitarian, aid-dependent human beings in contemporary German. Even if white German women seemed to be saying that it was really African that they desired, Americanized blackness ordered uh, the reassurance of something familiar. The American, Americanized blackness offered the reassurance of something familiar. English became the mode of speech. Hip-hop clothing became central. Attire, critical attire and grinding to R&B became central. 
In many ways, the history of African-American occupation suggests the possibility of national recognition for contemporary African men through the performance of African-American subjectivity. Of course, as Judith Butler notes, recognition also always comes at a cost. Black-only GI clubs in post-war Germany prefigure contemporary clubs where African-American men go to meet German women and vice versa. In the, st in the student film, Falsche Soldaten, Fake Soldiers, the Benin-born director depicts the ways in which African immigrants in Germany begin to impersonate American GIs by speaking English, <coughs> carrying fake IDs and driving American cars to gain access to and social and legal recognition, often by a marriage by white German women. The possibility of social re reconfiguration, for example, Africans finding a late legally recognized place in Germany often requires occupying the symbolic space of the African American body. I just wanted to move to a section called gendering, gendering occupation. While occupation through American GIs and a hip hop aesthetic emphasizes the masculinization of African American occupation, the black bodies by and through which occupation has been and continues to take place are not necessarily male. As the authors of the book, Fabi McKinnon, Showing Our Colors, note, one of their response, one, part of their response to the exclusion of, white, of, 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 of the white German, West German feminists in the 1980s was to reassert their place as Afro-Germans and point to the necess necessary links between race and gender. This intervention is inspired, empowered, and informed by U.S. civil rights movement and the presence and articulations of black women. Quote, with Audre Lorde, we created the term Afro-German borrowed from Afro-American as a term of our cultural heritage, close quote. According to Lord, quote, in the spring of 1984, I spent three months at the Free University in Berlin teaching a course in a black American women poets and a poetry workshop in English for German students. One of my goals in this trip was to meet black German women, for I had been told there were quite a few in Berlin, close quote. Since the end of the Second World War, it has, become, it has, it has, it has been through the term Besatzungskinder, occupation children, that many Afro-Germans have come to be popularly known, again, through the occupation of black American bodies, even if it is not the only social reality. Quote, after World War II, there was hardly any further mention of the African Germans born before or after 1919, close quote. Here the author refers to the so-called Rheinland Bastard or Rheinland Bastards, that is, the children of French African troops and white German women, and the disappearance of their presence from the popular social memory following their sterilization and stigmatization. However, the shift in the social imagination from Rheinland Bastards, Rheinland Bastards to occupation babies suggests a significant shift in the possibilities for black belonging, even if the term occupation in this context is sometimes understood and used negatively. As historian Heide Fernbach notes, quote, as federal and state officials became all too aware, their responses to the children was an important early testing case for the post-war German democracy, close quote. She continues, what emerged from reports by native local authorities were not narratives of German female victimization similar to those similar to the black horror stories that circulated after the First World War or tales of mass rape by Soviet troops in, East, in the East during the, the spring of 1945, but narratives of national disorder that linked racialized American masculinity with un, unrestrained native female sexuality, criminality, and main materialism. These qualities, at least materialism and female sexuality, would eventually be embraced by critical components of the German public in the post-World War II African-Americanized era broader implications for occupying black bodies. Uh, this part of my overall project on, on non-citizen youth politics points to many of the ways in which African-American occupation is linked to the processes of social transformation, that is, the reconfiguration of social and physical space, shifting positions of blackness from one's marginality to those anthropologists Jack Jacqueline Nassie Brown calls diasporic resources. But here, these resources are re-articulated to include not only those originally perceived as being of African descent, but also of those in other spaces of displacement or non-citizenship. Furthermore, while the analysis is heavily influenced by the specific histories of military occupation in the end, this is not the most significant meaning of the term or its possibilities. It is only a starting point for thinking about their articulations and limits, histories, and futures. Through this research, it has become clear that transformative occupation possesses both material and imaginary dimensions. It both inspires displaced subjects and occupies dominant space. Occupation itself becomes a position or place from which to speak, but speech alone is not its only form of articulation. While emphasizing specific histories and relationships, I have shown articulations of unanticipated alliances to think more specifically and more strategically about occupation in particular might advance the efficacy of these social forms already in process. 
Well, I pointed to the potential alliances, as Nadra Chalik, among other commentators, suggests. These alliances, for the most part, are not yet formed strategically as such. Their infrastructures are thin, and there is too little thinking about the political economy of their sustenance. Um, both the Nauhaus, the Bauhaus Nannienstrasse, that's, that's a theater in Kreuzberg where um, this, that film that I showed you in the beginning is going to actually be shown. And it's, it thinks of itself also as a, as a post-migrant theater, um, which is a term we can talk about. Um, so the, both the Bauhaus Nannienstrasse and the Theater for Real Democracy um, rely at least in part on state funding. On the other hand, occupation as a political analytics means more than simple adoption of aesthetic forms that happen to flow as a result of market forces. Critical counter-hegemonic occupation is based on consciously coordinated efforts, planning, and articulations with specific goals in mind. Thanks.